Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Yasmina Lyot, and I'm uh, the technical director at Second Story. And what we do at Second Story is we push the boundaries of storytelling using technology um, in ways to engage with the audience and, and through interactions and building shared experiences together. And that has been the focus of my work for, for many years. And uh, today I'm actually going to focus on Egypt. It's going to be an Egypt-centric talk because that's where I've been based the last three years. And I've been uh, focusing a lot on storytelling projects that really um, use technology to open up storytelling to the audiences again. Um, like, so to make it a communal, shared experiences the way it used to be, you know, around, around a campfire. And uh, really believing in empowering the, part, you know, the audience to be partners, collaborators, and participants. Now, obviously, it all started for me during the revolution, the Egyptian revolution in 2011, when, you know, during those first 18 days, Egyptians were documenting the revolution in real time, and they were doing so using Facebook and Twitter and regular media such as photos and videos. And, you know, the world essentially was witness to the front lines of history in the making. Everyone had access to some type of recording device, whether it's a high-end DSLR or a camera phone. Now, we, my partner and I, my partner Jigger Meta and I were thinking at the time, well, in 2011, well, with all this media being created and Egyptians being such great storytellers, how can we leverage all this media uh, to tell the story of the Egyptian revolution? Um, and so we started and we built this project called 18 Days in Egypt. And what 18 Days in Egypt is, it's a web-based, crowdsourced, collaborative storytelling platform where anyone who is there can help tell the story of the ongoing revolution. They can do so by uploading their own media and tell the story in their own voice. And the whole idea behind the website was to be, move beyond the 90-minute framework of a film and to, like, to document an ongoing story and let the community be the storytellers. Now, the point of doing this kind of project and not doing a film was we wanted to get at the, the heart of what was happening. With all this real-time, you know, massive information sharing on the ground, there's some really important stories about how events actually played out and how people actually relate to history and how they experience it. Since history, history isn't linear, it's multi-narrative, actually. And the problem was, you know, if you have media scattered across the country on hard drives and, and phones, and then you have things scattered on social media being drowned out by the always new events, the avalanche of news, there wasn't really a way to sort of, you know, follow all of this and document it properly. Um, and so we, we built um, a set of tools, tools that lets you go into your timeline, mash up your social media with your regular media to help tell this ongoing story of the Egyptian revolution. And the idea was, you know, the source is the storyteller, the people who are there, n creating a multi-narrative um, historical documentation where you no longer have one authoritative voice to document history. And that's because technology has made that outdated. That, that shouldn't be the way we tell stories anymore. Um, and on 18 Days in Egypt, we launched in 2012, so it took us, you know, a little bit of bootstrapping, and it, we launched in 2012, and the community has created, um, contributed over thousands of stories, and they've ranged from stories about the political situation and conflict and, and death and, and sad topics to the building of, of the new Egypt, however you feel about that to uh, love in the time of tear gas and revolution and art, and there's just a variety, variety of stories. And, and what's so special to me about this project and what I think is the success of it is that it's about the human side of it. It's the relatable human side. It's not the headlines. It's just the personal experiences, and it's a diverse set of ex human experiences. And hopefully this you know, site can live on for the next 10 years where people can come see um, how people actually felt during the, those first two years in Egypt and, and since. Um, I just wanted to quickly shout out, this is the 18 Days in Egypt team, so it's the team of developers and our community outreach team. So these are actually young uh, journalists or citizen journalists who bridge the digital divide in Egypt since we have low net penetration, about a quarter of the country's online. Um, and they want, we wanted to make sure that we was, was accessible. So, you know, taxi drivers and kiosk owners and, you know, the guy with the green produce mark, uh, cart, we wanted them to be part of the project as well. Um, the success of this project actually uh, led us to establish a citizen journalism incubator. It's a six-month program where, with weekly um, topics and trainings. Um, but unfortunately, we had to suspend this project this year because it's been a really, really um, unsafe environment for journalists in Egypt. 
Now, um, the, the, what, I, what I loved focusing and my passion in Egypt was about how do you engage with communities to start new dialogues, to create things together. And one of the most obvious ways to do that is to actually just you know, put it in the street, in the public space where people actually have to engage with it. Um, this project is a public street installation. It's in downtown Cairo, very close to Tahrir Square. And this was a collaboration with a street artist named Genzir. And the idea behind this... Um, I'll see, if you can still hear me, I'll keep going. The idea behind it was, you know, when someone would pass by, this, you know, this, this drawing would follow them and observe them. And it all started actually because we wanted people to start thinking in this local neighborhood and the people who are around downtown, which is a lot of people, a lot of th foot traffic. We wanted people to think about surveillance because at the time the government was super blasé about, oh, we're installing, you know, surveillance cameras all over the city. And then they're now um, really upping their internet surveillance program um, where they want to see what people are doing on Facebook and all of this and, you know, other platforms. And all of this is just to restrain uh, activism on digital platforms. So we wanted people to start thinking about it. And what was really uh, amazing is they did start understanding. They didn't know where this came from or why, or who did it. Um, but they did start talking about, well, who is this person? Why are they watching me? And every day we would use sometimes very famous figures, political figures, uh, political symbols, martyrs, things like that. Um, and what I want to mention quickly about this project, which was really exciting for me, was that the local neighborhood, they started treating it as a, their museum. So they would be docents. They'd bring people over and explain to their friends every day what you know, this face represented and why and what's going on. And I thought that was amazing that they just, it became their, you know, their street art, became their museum, their street museum. Um, now another uh, project that's also in the public space, uh, this was a very recent project. This is the Wonder Box, and it's a contemporary revival of an extinct cultural tradition in Egypt, which is like a, the Egyptian peep show or rarity show. So it's a mobile storytelling project uh, with live storytellers and musicians, which we did. And what we did differently is we also um, we kind of crowdsourced it. Uh, we crowdsourced it. It was all open sourced, and I'll explain how later. Um, all the stories came from the street. It was inspired by the street, made by the street, and the focus was to give something back beautiful to the street. Um, we wanted to make sure that children, you know, they don't have access to a lot of, you know, cultural sites, museums, or, or, or uh, basically stories or puppet shows with, that are with high quality storytelling. And we wanted to do that. We wanted to bring something that was beautiful back to, to the kids and something that people can just see. And what is this beautiful geodesic dome? What is this? Um, and so uh, this project essentially inside has Arduinos, it has a laptop, it has a projector, everything is battery powered, which was really hard to do, uh, adjustable LEDs, and like we built a stage with projection map puppets that move and, and um, accompanying stories that came from the streets. They were stories that we collected from uh, taxi drivers, uh, tuk tuk drivers, microbus drivers, the modern day hero. Uh, that was the idea. We wanted the, um, so the audience to be the modern day hero. And we built two. One is a more traditional ice cream cart looking one, and uh, it's interactive, so kids could move around fish and, and birds. And we wanted to create magic and surreal, like have them escape into the surreal world that was created with technology. Um, and this is actually, so when I mentioned this is an open source project, it was actually completely documented. Uh, we documented from the fabrication to architecture design, how we composed the music, how we uh, collected the stories to the uh, software and the magical world. So it's, uh, it's a published manual that we've been distributing also um, in Egypt. Now, um, so basically, uh, all these projects have been what I've been kind of busy with the last few years, and I've also been involved with this initiative that sort of, I would say, launched um, for real after the revolution as well, this idea of, of um, an art collective, a new media art collective called Open Lab Egypt, and we were five artists and from different disciplines that really wanted to um, explore the idea of more open collaboration. And there isn't such a, a culture in Egypt, and it was very difficult actually to find people that were like-minded that really want, really believe in knowledge sharing and building things together and doing these exchanges with countries or artists from different places and really building um, experiences together. And so this, you know, experiment with these artists, what we would do is just kind of have fun. We would build and interact immersive experiences in random uh, abandoned hotels and spaces. We would collaborate with artists around the world. 
And we wanted to just do tongue-in-cheek things to have. I, 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 would assume, I would say it's an adult playground. We wanted to create adult playgrounds uh, for people. And this eventually led to weekly meetups where we would do knowledge sharing. You know, not many people know what pure data is in Cairo. Or there aren't many experts in, you know, who know how to use a Zadora or someone who's like, working in processing. So we would do these weekly meetups of, of knowledge sharing. And so it was still you know, early on, but it was a start, right? It's a start uh, that this is starting to happen in Egypt and pick up. And now that brings me to me leaving Egypt, and I'm, I'm here in New York, uh, not here, in New York, and I'm, um, I joined Second Story. And uh, what, uh, Second Story the, in New York Lab is new. It's still, we're building it as we speak. And what's exciting to me about uh, coming back to the States and starting to you know, use some of these, this idea of creating shared culture experiences and bringing it back and, and, and do different things in the city is, is also because like, I really, I'm excited to join a place like Second Story. I, I'll explain a little bit how they got their name because I think it's actually a really, really nice idea, a nice story. The, um, for Second Story, the way it works is the guiding principle is the foundation. The backbone is the story. It's the narrative that you're trying to you know, communicate to your audience. And then anything you do after that, the, your, if you do an augmented reality experience, interactions, anything, that's the second story. And that's where the name comes from. And this idea, this technology-driven storytelling, when I, when I say I really do believe it's opening up uh, storytelling to audiences again, I really do believe that because it's already, it's already changed the way we are remembering history, documenting history, and the way we're telling stories. And it'll always keep, we'll always be able to keep breaking the rules with, with, in storytelling. Uh, so thank you very much.